Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Markowski, and today we're going to recreate another painting by another one of my favorite artists. Today we are once again going to be looking at the work of Margaret Keane, and we're going to be painting this painting, attempting to, the Blonde Contessa from 1971, which is uh, one of the works she made after the whole scandal that involved her husband had uh, finally passed and blown over, and she was making paintings under her own name and taking 100% credit that she deserved for her work, a, a wild story, which was documented in a film, Big Eyes, a few years ago. So um, I think this, I love this painting. I, the reason we didn't do it last class is because if I had to choose one or the other, I thought the other one was much more iconic for the work that she's most familiar with. But I, I think I might even prefer this painting. Um, it's, I think, well, we'll get into a little bit more of the issues, or the, the issues, the story behind this painting, um, once we sort of really get uh, this plane off the ground here. So um, if you're painting along with us or watching for the very first time this is the pro this is this kind of the the way we're going to go about things we're going to get the image on the canvas i'll show you how to do that we're going to stain it we're going to talk a little bit about margaret Keane's biography although we did like an hour of that in the previous episode so i'm going to try not to cover too much of the same territory we're going to do a little bit of an underpainting background ideally we can get the background done all in one pass and then spend uh two or three of these foreground passes if we can get done in four hours that would be awesome so um that's the goal for today obviously if you're watching afterwards you can just jump to the the timestamps in the playlist down below um, of course Especially if you're new, uh, like the video, subscribe, hit the notification bell. That really helps the channel. Oddly enough, somewhere between 60 to 70 percent of the people that watch these videos are not current subscribers. That just blows my mind. So that would be hugely helpful if even just 10 percent of the people that regularly watch but don't subscribe subscribed. That would really help the channel grow. Um, and I would have to rely less on people's donations, and I can just deal with the ad revenue. Um, but if, of course, if you want to support the channel, uh, here's a couple of great ways to do that. And thank you to everyone for your ongoing support. You can use PayPal, uh, Super Chat within YouTube, although YouTube takes like 40% of what you donate. Um, send an e-transfer by email. My email is on my website and the Facebook group. So if you want to send an e-transfer or you want to send a check in the mail or anything like that, contact me through the Facebook group or my website. Okay. So let's go to our first step here. Our first step is to get the image onto the canvas. Now, this is a, you know, a relatively complex image i'd say for a beginner drawer now of course you could take my free drawing course here on youtube and hundreds of thousands of people have done that already and and seems to be quite popular i guess so that would really help you there's about like 10 episodes on how to draw people and that would really allow you to do this sketch by eyeballing it but if you want to just focus on painting today um, then you can download this free template that I've drawn on my iPad Pro using the Procreate app. And so I'll show you where you can download that for free. Oh, here's the Facebook group. Join that right now if you're just watching for the first time. So you click the link for the template, uh, the outline, and it takes you to this Dropbox folder. And in that Dropbox folder, you'll see at the top here are the basic resources to get you started. The next um, ones here that are that begin with a letter. These ones are, are more basic paintings. And then the next 150 folders or whatever here are for slightly more complex stuff. And that's where Margaret Keane falls in under here. So you'll see here's the resources for the previous episode, uh, The Stray. And then here's for the Blonde Contessa here, these three files there. So you'll see that there's two versions of the outline. One's a JPEG, one's a PDF, whatever's easier for you to print out on your home printer, inkjet, laser jet, uh, water jet printer, 
<laughs> whatever you can use to get this image on. You could even use tracing paper, hold it up, to, tape it to your computer screen and trace it that way. And then use this exact process we're about to do to get the image onto the canvas. So um, here we've got the image. I've just printed it out on my inkjet printer. And then I'm going to paint this on a 9 by 12 sized canvas panel. So they come wrapped in plastic. I like this this brand and these are really nice canvas boards. They're thicker, they're sturdier, they feel much more um, like they're gonna last as opposed to some of the stuff from the dollar store. It seems to be getting worse and worse in quality but certainly if you're a beginner it works just fine, right? Uh, but then I take it out of the plastic, I give it a light sanding and then I apply white acrylic gesso, a layer over top let it dry overnight and then sand it again and I get a much smoother surface and especially if we're painting details like this it night and day the difference it makes to helping you get your painting done. if you're in a situation where you don't have access to gesso you could use white paint and you could paint that on and it would help fill in the texture the weave of the canvas which is a fabric after all and it's kind of tricky to paint onto fabric. So let's get this image onto the canvas. What do you think about right in the middle? Like maybe, maybe I'll move it down just a little bit. Okay. And then now I'm gonna use some carbon transfer paper this is actually graphite transfer paper that I'm going to use here. And you can see I've used it many times. So it's not like you just use it once and then throw it away. You can use it maybe a dozen times or more, depending on the images that you're tracing, the complexity of them. And then I'm going to use a pen here. I also like using a red pen or pencil because that just helps me see the lines I've drawn and which lines I have yet to draw. I'm not going to trace all of these lines. Just the biggest shapes. Eyebrows. So remember, the template is just there to help us with the drawing process. It just speeds up the that first step so that we can get to painting as quickly as possible. But we don't want to be slaves to the template and worried about um, not doing it perfectly. I think there's much better things to worry about in life. I really like the way that she's painted these hands. I think there, there's like a, it really reminds me of a few Leonardo da Vinci paintings, which we'll look at here uh, shortly. There's a really nice delicacy to them. De delicacy? It's, they seem really delicate. Is it del delicacy? That's They're delicately painted, not de they're a delicacy. That's 
That doesn't sound right. Um, okay. So just before I peel this off, let's just double check that the lines are there. That looks good. Okay. and clean here, put everything back in order. And there we are, and in the chat there, there's Pascaline and Kathy and Freak Freaky Frequency and Pascal all there saying hello. Uh, Freaky says, I tried to learn drawing two to three times, always failed. Your videos are the first time I'm learning it. Thank you. That is awesome. That's so cool. That makes me so happy. And I'm also super proud of you for not giving up. That tells me a lot about who you are. That You have tried and you failed, tried and you failed, tried and you failed, and things just didn't seem to be working, but you were persistent. You didn't give up. That's the... That's the most important thing and that tells me if you if you're willing to to keep on going time get up and and go each time you run up against a wall then there's probably a real artist inside there just waiting to be set free so well done freaky freaky frequency why does that sound like a tongue twister freaky frequency freaky frequency try saying that five times fast Okay, so let's move to our next step here. Um, <laughs> okay. Now that we've got our image on the canvas, let's stain it with a little bit of color and then we'll, we can get the painting really started. So this process is called the imprimatura. It's an Italian word that's been around for a thousand plus years. Artists have been using it kind of, uh, most art, most painters were using it going, starting really at the Renaissance as artists started to move from walls, mural painting and panel painting to painting on canvas. And artists have used lots of different colors to do this. So let's talk about maybe the palette that I'm about to use here. So I'm gonna use a split primary palette. That's how I've done all 295 painting episodes so far. That's a lot of, of uh, paintings we've made. And you can be the judge yourself. You can look at them and see if they turned out. I love this palette because we can paint anything, literally anything. We can mix billions of different colors just from these eight tubes of paint, which is a lot more than most palettes. Or if you watch the, the, the other people's videos, they'll say, okay, you just find these five colors and that'd be great for maybe that painting. But if you want to do a totally different painting, well, you got, you got to go out and buy another set of, and then you, before you know it, you got 30 different colors and oh my goodness. <laughs> So this is what I teach when I go to elementary schools. This is what I teach at the university I teach at. Um, so we were, what we're using, the split primary palette means we take those three primary colors and we split them into two according to color temperature. So color temperature means that one color appears to be warmer or have an orange quality to it versus, and orange pigments versus cool tends to have a, a colder greenish hue um, that, that might not be necessarily readily visible, but especially the combination of another color will unlock its uh, kind of qualities, perhaps. So um, I'm going to use these six tubes of paint plus white, and I rarely use black because I can mix that black with those six colors. So really, I just need seven tubes of paint to paint virtually any painting any human being has ever painted throughout the course of human history. I think that's pretty cool. So, and if pff, this, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I don't want to get started. <laughs> okay, so here's, um, I was going to tell a big long story, but of, you know, going back to the cavemen and women and, you know, but I was like, you know, right, let's just paint. Okay, so this is the color I'm about to use to stain the background, this Azo Yellow Deep. It's a warm yellow. I really like it because it gives this kind of 
Kodachrome summer uh, warmth that kind of comes through the painting, whether it's totally visible or, or basically um, not invisible, but just maybe not necessarily immediately perceptible. It's there and it's working its magic. Uh, and so, but you don't have to. In fact, I don't think that Margaret Keene did any, did any premature of stain. So you'd be fine doing it. And there are a lot of artists that don't do it. Anyway, these are the tubes of paint that I'm about to use. You could also use golden paints. It's um, a much more expensive professional grade of paint. And most people, beginners, won't notice any difference whatsoever, except the cost, which is at least double or triple the cost of the paint I'm about to use. And also a little bit thicker. Uh, Liquitex, that works as well. You can use Windsor & Newton, Artist Loft from Michael's Art Supply. Uh, you can use Buzz, Holbein, Dialer Rowney, Fevacryl, Nova Color, Chroma Color. But I'm afraid to say I'm not a, the biggest fan of Museum Color, nor am I a big fan of Peebo, both of whom use... I think too much titanium white as a filler to make the paint more opaque, which is, you know, common in, in most student grade paints that put a little bit of white in there just to, as you know, like McDonald's puts sawdust in their hamburgers, allegedly, or just, I'm just making fun. So please don't sue me McDonald's. Um, but uh, it's a, what that does is it makes it impossible for us to mix a black. Now, you can always just use black if you want, but as you might know if you've watched me a few times, I like mixing it myself and getting that, those new, more nuanced colors. So, let's uh, apply some paint to the surface of this painting. Oh, I'm so excited. I, I had, uh, I, over the course of this past week, I, I had all of these tubes of paint that were um, basically empty, but had a little bit of paint just in the end. I had maybe, for each color, about a dozen or more tubes, and I went through, I cut them open. In fact, maybe that's what I should use today. Let's, uh, let's do that. What's the purpose of doing all that work if you're not going to use them? Oh, look at this. Like, look at this. A dozen jars of, of blue paint. Can't squeeze any more paint out. And that lid, the paint is right up to the lid. Right? So, and that's probably $50 worth of paint in that one jar. Like, look at this. This, that's maybe... Yeah, this is like... Probably three hundred dollars worth of paint that would otherwise have just gotten thrown out. So let's let's use today as an opportunity to recycle some paint. Okay, so I put my warm yellow here, this Azo Yellow Deep. I put a little water in here. This is really the only time I use water when I'm painting with acrylic, as people have probably heard me say at nauseum. I just mix it up. The reason I add water here when I don't usually do it elsewhere is it just is going to help this color. It basically transforms this color from a paint into a stain. And the, the gesso that's on the surface of the canvas is going to absorb that water really well because essentially gesso is plaster suspended in an acrylic medium. And if you're as uh, accident prone as I have been throughout my life um, and you've had to go to the hospital because you've broken a bone or two you know what a cast is like and you remember them telling you don't get this cast wet put a plastic bag around it if you want to go to the, um, take a shower or anything and if it got, got a little bit hot or sweaty, and that cast will absorb water better than a sponge, and it starts to stink. And, um, <laughs> so, using... Uh, so, so anyway, plaster absorbs water really well. So that's why um, adding a little bit of water in here is going to really help 
that color stain the plaster, soak into the surface, and uh, in a way that even medium can't quite uh, replicate. Look at that, beautiful. So it's, um, there's our image ready to go. Also, I'm just gonna wipe that excess paint off onto my rag here. And that way, most of that paint gets on the rag. And, you know, despite the fact that this water is changing to yellow, there's much less pigment on there and the brush cleans faster than if I just try to clean that, take that brush and put it in here. And also less acrylic paint goes down the sink and into the ocean and into the a fish and sushi that we eat, right? My goodness. <laughs> Look at all the comments there. What's what's going on in the chat there? Oh my goodness. It's, it's late or early in the morning, depending on the way you want to think about it. Kathy says, it was great watching the feedback episode on Sunday, and I'll fix a few things thanks to Michael's help. And Pascal says, awesome, Kathy. That's the best thing that can happen. Improving and learning. <laughs> I should get you to do the subtitles for these, Pascal. <laughs> uh... I do repeat the same thing over and over and over, especially at the beginning of these episodes, which doesn't surprise me. I notice, I notice often the first five minutes of an episode, are, um, people aren't necessarily, or the the people who have been watching for a long time might not necessarily tune in because they're like, oh my goodness, it's like listening to a broken record. Um, and I sometimes I think, well, maybe I don't, let's, there's no point in repeating myself, but then I again, I remember that there's a lot of people that have, n have never seen me before and so, rather than pointing them to this video or that video and telling them to do this or that, um, just uh, telling that information helps um, helps them kind of get started here. So, we're gonna need. One of our first things is going to be to make a black and a lot of it, so I'm going to put that down there. I mean, that's just crazy. Paint that could not come out of a tube, and now I've got so much of it that that lid can't even close it tight enough, otherwise it's going to spill out all over the edges. And that's enough paint. That could That's easily going to last me six, seven months. This obviously is more time consuming than just squeezing paint right out of the tube and moving on. Now, I don't even, I don't think I'm actually gonna use my cool red. We'll see if I end up needing it at some point. I suspect I might not. I just, oh, I, I love color. Like, just seeing a big jar of paint like that gets me super excited. Um,
SSW says, Good morning, sir. Good morning. I love seeing some of the uh, new names in the chat. People who are do watch, doing the drawing program and tuning in to say hello. I'm just going to blow dry this to lock that paint in place. Uh, just interesting comment there, Kathy, uh, where did I see that? Uh, yeah, Kathy says, I'm using a new computer television monitor, and the yellow looks so much more like a cool yellow, not a warm yellow. Yikes! Pascal says, uh, maybe the TV needs a little tuning, need to find a test image or something to test. That's, uh, that's true. Um, yeah, that, I can totally, I, I get that, you know, um, each TV is a little bit, even my own, I've got a TV here, I have a television there, and I've got a computer monitor over here, and those often both have the same image on there, and then I have my painting, which is also on the screen in front of me as well, and often there's, there, there's three different <laughs> colors on there. And so that can be kind of confusing for me, as well as um, it can, and I'm not even exactly sure what it looks like outside and when it goes out into the world. So, um, that in in that sense, you know, you I mean, you can download the image from the Dropbox folder and paint along to that, and you know, always remember getting you know it's. Uh, Every, everyone perceives color a little bit differently, and what might look warmer to to me might look cooler to somebody else. There is official uh, color temperature information on various different um, websites, you know, the, the paint companies. In fact, maybe let's just, uh, I'll show you where you could find that information. I think I'm probably, do I have it in the description below I'm not sure let's uh but I like using the this link here so gambling colors is the oil paint company that I use I'm a huge fan of gambling paint and I've visited the factory in Portland Oregon great people they gave me a tour and I watched the paint getting mixed and um, most paint companies are actually relatively small and operated by maybe a dozen people or, or so. Even the really big, like Gamblin is one of the biggest oil paint companies in North America. And you walk in there and you feel like this is just like a mom and pop operation, which basically it is. Um, it would be, you know, yeah. So what's nice about this is they have all of the paints that they make and some information about their temperature so you know you can look here 
for instance, I don't think they make, or at least they 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 make a warm yellow, but they don't call it azo yellow deep. So if you're like oh, azo yellow, I don't see that here. So what we could do is we could go to divide them into color families and temperatures. And let's say we, here's some yellows, but we, let's say we want to go to our warm yellows. We could look here. And this gives us some idea of what the various different warm yellows that they make look like. And worse comes to worse, what you can do is you could print this out and then you could go to your art supply store and find one of these tubes of paint and then compare it to a color from a different paint company. Um, or you could use the lists that I have here in the Dropbox folder and then you can, you know, if you can't, if you're, you can just find that tube of paint because I've, I've, there's all those uh, are lists of different colors. Anyway, do your best. It's not a, it's, it's, art is not a perfect science, although there have been artists throughout the course of human history that have tried to turn it into an exact science. But what I think is amazing and super fun about art is, is how objective it can be, how many different possibilities there are. Um, and, and I think that actually provides a tremendous amount of freedom to each artist. That even as much as we try to do it perfectly or exactly, it's always going to come out a little bit different. Because we're human beings, we're not robots, and there's always going to be some level of interpretation and transformation. And those things are awesome, right? I think that's to be celebrated. Differences, right? That's what makes life worth living. So, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about Margaret Keane and her biography very briefly, and, and maybe more so today's painting. So, let's um, go back here. So, as I said, in the previous episode that we did last week, focusing on Margaret Keene's painting, The Stray, I talked for uh, maybe at least an hour about Margaret Keene's biography and the complex story involving her um, abusive ex-husband, Walter Keene. Fascinating story, which is told fairly well, fairly accurately, as much as, you know, Hollywood movie uh, can, uh, about her biography and the ridiculous, wild um, situation that involved her husband taking credit for all of her work until the day he died. Even though it, he was proven to be a fraud in court. Uh, anyway, so Margaret Keene is born in um, Nashville, Tennessee in 1927 and passes away just recently at age 94 in California and is born Peggy Doris Hawkins. And after she separates from her husband, she uh, starts signing her painting instead of just Keen, which is nice and perfectly ambiguous, so that it was, I don't know, Keen who? Is it Margaret Keen or Walter Keen? Well, Walter Keen capitalized on that um, as, a, as a way of taking credit for her work. But uh, she used the, in fact, we can even see this on today's painting. You can see how she signs her work including today's painting, M.D.H. Keene, and uh, which stands for Margaret Doris Hawkins Keene. Um, and it, for I think if you watched the very end of last week's episode, I was like, but why isn't it P.D.H.? Of course, I had to look up that Peggy is short for Margaret. So even though she was on her birth certificate named Peggy, um, when she was older, she went with the more formal Margaret as her first name, which I thought was kind of strange at first. And then I just remembered that I named our daughter Edie as, a, as opposed to Edith, which would be maybe the more formal version of Edie. So maybe when our daughter is older, she will also go by a, a longer version of her own name that wasn't even given to her. Anyway, so Margaret Keene um, is born in Nashville, and um, we talked also briefly about how she had um, surgery when she was younger, 
and that damaged her hearing and so she, for a few years at least in the movie they make it sound like she had this uh, hearing condition and then recovered from it I wasn't able to find any information that confirmed that or not um, but anyway she because of, of not being able to hear properly she had to rely on looking at people's lips and eyes in order to communicate and so I talked about how there seems to be a fairly direct correlation between that incident and her method, her her own um, uh, way of, of dealing with that situation ultimately set the, the, the stage for her becoming famous for painting people with really big eyes. Um, let me see. I don't know how much, I don't really want to repeat the whole uh, tragic, although happy, um, ultimately happy story of her and her husband. Uh, I think I did that thoroughly last episode. Uh, you know, she, once she had um, extricated herself from that marriage, in she separates in 1964, moves to Hawaii. And officially has her gets a divorce in 1965. She converts to uh, be, to the Jehovah's Witness faith, which part of the the uh, one of the the tenets of Jehovah's Witness is a sort of um, a. Essentially, one should conduct themselves with total honesty, not telling lies, not um, uh, fudging the truth or anything like that. So she felt it was really important to her and to her faith to, to be honest with her past and claim authorship over the work that she had made. And of course, her uh, former husband sued her for slander saying that how dare she all of a sudden claim that she painted all these paintings that I did there was the court case the eventually was found in her favor because the judge made them both make a painting in front of the jury and how convenient it was that all of a sudden he developed a shoulder a sore shoulder and was unable to paint that day Meanwhile, she cranked out a finished painting in 53 minutes. And so the judge, I think, <laughs> clearly uh, sided with Margaret Keene. Also, the fact that he never, ever made a single painting uh, be after that moment. And even some would argue never made a painting before that moment either. Uh, that he had also presented previous work by other artists as his own before he even met Margaret Keene. So this was kind of a pattern of his. Uh, meanwhile, Margaret Keene continued to make original work in her own style. And so that just, I mean, I, I, this seems fairly open and shut case here, right? Um, one of the things that um, Margaret Keene you know, people say that her work uh, past 1965 became more positive, happier, more joyful, life affirming. Um, she began, she still painted some of the iconic images of, um, you know, like these, some would say like sad children, like the, the painting we made last week, The Stray, where we see this little child, this is, Let's see, we'll just look at the larger version. This small child holding this stray cat, after it's called the stray, crying, um, you know, likely saying, Mommy, can I keep the cat? Right, I can imagine my own daughter who looks very similar to this saying the same thing. Um, and, you know, one of the things that um, Walter Keene he, he basically co-opted her work and, and came up with a whole new story for it and said that that these are 
um, that after World War II, where he supposedly uh, was born and raised and saw children walking the streets of Berlin without parents, and they were lost children, the image was seared into his mind, and he felt a need to, to depict them, all of which was, of course, completely uh, false and made up. Um, but Margaret Keene, I think after she uh, uh, moved on from that terrible relationship, supposedly started making more positive work. I did mention last episode that I, I don't know if I fully feel like her work radically transformed um, post-1965. The one thing that does seem um, that I do notice is that she began painting not just young children with big eyes, but started painting more portraits of uh, more mature, older women. Uh, like today's episode is obviously going to feature... Uh, she started painting pictures that had more uh, more landscape features in the background or landscapes themselves, paintings of animals, etc. Um, like this here. You know, so some of these paintings were typical of the stuff that she made earlier on in her career but some of these ones are are definitely um, I think major innovations in her her growth as an artist and you know one of the things that uh, we talked also about last class was the 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 constant dismissal of her work by uh, the major critics in the art world of, you know, and those critics being employed at, say, the New York Times, Time Magazine, the various different art magazines like Art, art in America, Art Forum, um, Flash Art. At the, at the time Margaret Keene was making paintings, routinely dismissed her work as hacky, as kitschy, uh, as as essentially worthless and that really never changed and it really hasn't changed even to this day there's 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 no uh, let's say wiki art page when you look up her work i don't it doesn't there's no museums that pop up and say you know here's the metropolitan museum and here's the five paintings of margaret Keynes in the metropolitan museum's collection or the you know um Pompidou Center in Paris or the National Gallery of uh, in Washington DC you don't see anything like that really we see some of the articles about the uh, the absurd uh, tragic comedy of her of her life with Walter and then we have her own website or, own, or at least a website that was uh, created to feature her work and which is what we're looking at here but for the most part, um, and you can buy original pieces of hers, paintings for $200, $300. I would be careful about just buying them off of eBay or, or that they, they probably will be fakes um, and try to find a more trusted source, like buying them directly from her estate. But the fact that they're so cheap is just boggles my mind. I mean, as I said last time, if you're wanting to, if you, if you really like her work and you want to collect some of her work, she might be the the, the most accessible, most well-known artist that I can think of, right? Some of these, again, I mean, there are people selling paintings in coffee shops probably a block away from where most of us live that are charging more for their work than this great artist's who had a, a major Hollywood movie made about her um, and was one of the most popular artists of the 1950s and 60s. And her work is still like radically underpriced. Are there some of her works that are better than others? Of course, absolutely, right? 
but that's also the case with literally every single artist out there. You know, I was I was reading some of the negative criticisms of Margaret Keane's work over the last week, and one of the things that kind of keeps coming up is like, oh, it's like the same kind of, it's like a broken record. Here's another painting of a close-up of a woman's face or a little girl's face with big eyes. Wow, we haven't seen a couple of thousand of those before. And I think, what, how many other artists make the exact same painting over and over and over again? Do we hear people, I mean, people do say that about Mark Rothko or Jackson Pollock or Pablo Picasso or a lot of old white guys. Um, but that doesn't stop them from selling their work for hundreds of millions of dollars each. So why are people, um, why, why does somehow that criticism stick with this female artist? And I think that tells you everything you need to know. That here's a woman who managed to break through and become ubiquitous and break into the, into the, um, into the national international conversation and the only way that the gatekeepers of the art world had to prevent her from getting into the inner sanctum i mean goodness what would happen if any of these paintings showed up on the walls of the museum of modern art like the the foundations would crumble i suppose uh and um i mean why are our students in university, like the university I teach at, not studying portraiture by looking at a painting like this here, for instance, which looks a little bit like Priscilla Presley here, probably, you know, 1969 or when it might have been. Was Priscilla Presley? Yes, yeah, she was married to Elvis at the time. I mean, this is a gort. I mean, there's so many beautiful paintings that Margaret Keene made that, um, like that. I mean, we could have done this painting. And that's, I mean, I mean, so, I, I'm, and there's, you, you saw there's hundreds and hundreds of them on our own. Uh, so, yeah, it just boggles my mind. Um,. Someone in the chat there. I'm sorry, I don't. I can't uh, read Japanese, so I, I can't. I don't know your name, but says, "I'm watching from Japan. Your class is very easy to understand and a lot of fun. I fell in love with drawing, and I'm looking forward to another wonderful class." Oh my goodness, that is so cool! Thank you so much, and thanks for saying hello for all the way in Japan. That's great. Oh, it makes me so excited that that uh, our audience is global. So, um, I, I do want to mention as well the connection to the that uh, uh, that Margaret Keene also herself mentioned, which is her admiration of the work of Amadeo Mondigliani. And next week, and actually for the next two weeks, we're going to be focused on this artist's work. So I felt I kind of wanted to juxtapose. Um, these two great artists, one after another. Uh, I was thinking of maybe doing a Mondigliani painting, and then a Keen painting, and then another Mondigliani painting, and I, and I realized my brain is just too small. I have to kind of uh, separate them in half so that I don't start to confuse all the details. Uh, but Mondigliani, you know, a bit of a tragic figure who died quite young at age 35. Let's... Um, Take a look at some of his work here. There's a few p paintings of nude women, very typical for for a male artist at the turn of the last century. Lots of uh, female nudes, um, but one of the things that we see, kind of the I guess the trademark features of Mondigliani's paintings are off or. First of all, the, 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 the most cited one is the way that Mondigliani painted eyes. And there's sort of a, a, a moment where he stops painting pupils and irises and just leaves the eyes blank. Or technically he paints them black or gray or dark blue, that kind of thing. But the eyes are kind of these empty uh, spaces. We'll talk about in next week's episode why that's the case. 
Um, but Mondigliani, so the, the way that he paints the eyes, and of course, Margaret Keane also has her own idiosyncratic way of painting the eyes, in this case, making them really big. Um, other things with, with Mondigliani are the, the elongated uh, features, the long necks, narrow faces, long limbs and fingers uh, that he also does when he makes sculptures. I don't know if there's any sculptures here on uh, the Wikipedia page, but, uh, you know, like this is, you know, an iconic painting by Mondigliani, and we, we see kind of, you know, the this figure that's almost stretched out in an unnatural fashion. Uh, the neck maybe twice as long as, as one might say it should be. And this is, looks very similar to, the, the, you know, the the way that that Margaret Keane painted, especially these more mature paintings of older women, as opposed to the young children that she became famous for, we see that same sort of thing, like these really long necks, elongated arms, long fingers. The other thing that uh, that I see with Mondigliani is the way that he treats the backgrounds. Often his backgrounds are either just blank i mean there's there might be color very quickly painted in there but there's not usually a lot of detail it's not like there's forests and mountains or bookshelves often it's just like these mostly like just a, a empty wall uh, or just like a black or gray so his he's really focusing his attention on the sitter itself or herself himself um, the other thing, I guess maybe one of the major differences between Mondigliani and Keane is that Mondigliani has this very expressionist or painterly approach to applying paint onto the surface where we, we can see every brushstroke. Like there's no uh, attempt whatsoever to hide the brushstrokes, to smooth everything down as artists had done for a thousand plus years beforehand and that's very typical of avant-garde painting at the turn of the last century when we think of Matisse and Monet and uh, uh, Degas, uh, uh, Frida Kahlo, Emily Carr, Group of Seven here in Canada. I mean artists became more and more um, uh, expressive with their paint and sort of the painting quicker. Part of that really has to do with photography and artists trying to, like the photography created like was like an earthquake um, in that all of a sudden artists look at what a camera can do and say, well, we're out of business. What, do, I mean, our job for the past, you know, 10,000 years was to paint portraits of kings and queens and then eventually regular people and now somebody can just take a picture and move on and do it in minutes what's wh what are we going to do so artists became more expressive like well we have to do things that a camera can't do so that was very typical of art in art in the early 1900s so you have margaret Keane though arriving on the scene in the you know late 40s early 50s and at that time you have a movement that's really taking over called abstract expressionism and abstract expressionism is most closely identified with artists like Jackson Pollock uh, Jean-Paul Riopelle here in Canada, although he was part of a Canadian movement called the Automatistes. Um, but, you know, essentially all these, it's funny, there's really not a, a great Pollock example here, even though Pollock would be probably the artist most closely identified with abstract expressionism. Let's just scroll down here. So, or not another painting what okay okay well 
I mean, here's Jackson Pollock making a painting, but really, so one of the things that's happening in the early 1940s, early 50s, is you have Pollock and, and all these other men making, you know, big, masculine, like they're big paintings, like literally maybe 10, 15 feet long, like the size of a city bus. You know, they're, they're taller than most people can reach, you know, even if they're standing on a ladder. You know, so there's big, masculine paintings, and they're abstract. They're, you know, um, and then how does um, a female artist at that same period, you know, um, stand out? Well, probably doing the exact opposite of that. And doing, and so even though she's doing figurative paintings, she's not going to go back to the way Mondigliani or Picasso made paintings. She's going to make paintings that maybe harken back to a previous time where artists uh, maybe painted with a bit more refinement and less outwardly expressionist. So the what I find, um, you know, I think even though I don't know if, um, I don't know if, if there's anything on record of Margaret Keene talking about Leonardo da Vinci, but I see her her work as really capturing similar uh, qualities that you know artists 500 years before her were doing, and we see this um, you know here's a painting we did uh, La Scapigliata. We did this painting about a year and a half ago, I think. So if you want to... And we did the Mona Lisa as well. Um, oh, uh, yeah, let me see. Okay, so this is one of the paintings of Leonardo that... Re th this is what... When I think... When I when I saw today's painting by Margaret Keane, I thought it reminded me a lot of this painting, oddly enough, right? So we have... Here's Margaret Keane... And here we have the Lady with an Ermine by Leonardo da Vinci. And one of the kind of iconic features of this painting is also those elongated limbs, those long fingers, long neck. Um, and eventually, <laughs> I made the mistake. This is probably a huge file. Let's see how long it takes to load. Maybe while that's happening, let's just see if there's anything else. So you see kind of, even here with the Mona Lisa, these very delicate hands. I mean, they're, most people, when they look at the Mona Lisa, you know, look endlessly at her smile, which, you know, is I iconic, I suppose. But when I look at Leonardo, I'm most fascinated by it, the, the masterful way that he paints hands. And I think lady with an ermine which is still loading here let's just let's see in here we see these long delicate fingers right and i see that same sort of thing in the way that she's making this i mean even like i mean let's just flip this around so just rotate that I mean, look at that. I mean, it's very, very similar, right? We see, you know, those kind of, um, I wouldn't say bony fingers. They don't, it's not like that she is emaciated, but they're, they're just, there's a delicacy, not delicacy, I said that too early. There's a delicateness to the way that they're painted that is, I think, really, um, there, it shows a precision and a great deal of restraint of patience. Um, so, yeah. I, I, so that... I, and so the reason why I'm spending time here talking in detail about some of the artists that... that um, like Mondigliani, who she was... Um, she herself mentioned as, as major influences and then talking about Leonardo, is I think it's important to to 
place Margaret Keene's work within an art historical context so that her place within art history can be acknowledged. That she's not just some, you know, hack that was doing a bunch of really bad, kitschy art and therefore has no place within the art museum or the canon of art that she is more than talented skilled enough to merit placement alongside all of those other artists most of whom are old white men right so uh the again the fact as far as i'm concerned the only reason why she hasn't been embraced by the intelligentsia of the art world is the fact that she was a woman and that she was um uh, and th I think the fact that her husband took advantage of her and claimed his work as her own and that she kind of reluctantly went along with it for almost a decade, I think, again, perversely enough, gives ammunition to those same people to say that she uh, wasn't good enough to stand up for herself and all sorts of just ridiculously outdated misogynist ideas and so i um part of this episode is for is is just a little bit of my attempt to recuperate her reputation as as far as i'm concerned one of the great masters of our time who should be seen alongside uh, those other great artists who came before her and as far as I'm concerned, I mean, I love Mondigliani, and we're going to be we're spending two episodes over the next month talking about Mondigliani's work. But I, you know, if I had to choose between two paintings that I want on my wall, I would probably, you know, I would, I think I'd rather have this painting than a, than the Mondigliani's we're going to do next week. Not, I mean, not that you shouldn't tune in and paint those paintings, but I, I just personal preference like this better and i think you could probably buy this painting for maybe a thousand dollars i mean that's just crazy I, I mean if i was a museum director and i i i was i and i had a even a modest budget i would run out and buy as many of these things as possible because also margaret Keene is is that she's a, a name a name brand if you want to use that that uh um that language that's a great way of bringing people, especially young people, especially young women, into the museum and get them to be inspired with modern and contemporary art. Um, so yeah, just it defies defies my 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 imagination or my mind to come up with with ways why this isn't. Uh... Oh, Pascal says it's on sale for twenty six thousand dollars actually. If anyone's interested in it, <laughs> well, you know, twenty six thousand dollars. I mean, yeah. I mean, most of us don't have that kind of money laying around. That's the price of, of like an inexpensive car. But considering how much you know the Mondigliani paintings we're looking at painting next week sell for, your starting price is around eight eighty million dollars, right? So, for the price of one Mondigliani painting. You could essentially buy every single Margaret Keene painting ever made, open your own art museum, and you would probably have lineups going out the door for the next 50 years. So if anybody wants to uh, support my business plan here, please uh, um, send me an, an email down below and, and let's get on this because it's, it's high time that uh, attitudes change. Okay, I think I have, uh, I'm going to get off my soapbox and let's start painting. So, let's now start with our next step, which is to paint some lines over top of our underdrawing. Now again, you could skip this step, and I know that throughout, um, throughout the art world, different people have different associate different meanings to this term underpainting. Some people will will literally combine the underdrawing, or as I say, like the image transfer process, the underdrawing, the imprimatur, and the underpainting all into one step. And that's fine. Uh, essentially what one would be doing is kind of sketching a painting out with the paintbrush 
directly onto the canvas. That takes a lot of confidence um, and skill to be able to pull something like that off. Um, so the majority of people are gonna draw the image out either by eyeballing it or use the image transfer like I do. And then potentially doing the imprimatur or combining the imprimatur with the underpainting. Again, two steps into one. So, but I like to kind of split these into individual steps. Um, and then if you're feeling, you know, like courageous, you can start kind of combining anything that we do and using your own approach. Um, okay. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to mix my own black and what I've, I've ap applied a bunch of extra paint on here for that purpose. Cause there's a lot of black in today's episode. Now, if you're, if the idea of mixing your own black is terrifying to you and you are, you're, you try doing this and you just have a great deal of difficulty. First of all, I would say try, I would continue to keep trying because, um, You'll, even when I do this, I'm never going to get it 100% perfect. So what I've done is I'm taking my cool yellow and my cool blue, mixing them together. I know this is also cool yellow here that I just took from. I just using, I'm going to use a bunch of it, so I'm just put it right there on the palette. We mix that together and we get this really intense green. Ideally, half and half. And now we're going to take... Um, ideally the same amount of warm red because warm red is the color that is directly opposite from that green on the color wheel. I might have put a bit too much on there. We'll see. We just have to make, once we blend that color in, see how it kind of looked a little bit brown and the more and more I mix that red into the green, those colors cancel each other out and we just get a nice solid black. Um, oh, you know what? And I'm going to put this here. I forgot to get my white out. And I just want to show really quickly that we can take black, add a little bit, or the black that we just mixed, add a little bit of white to it, and then it's going to start revealing the gray that's inside. And so that actually looks like I did a pretty good job of making a neutral gray. If it looks a little bit more purple, that's because we got maybe enough red and blue and we need more yellow. If it looks a little bit green, it means we got enough yellow and blue and we need more red. If it looks a little bit brown, it means we've got enough red and yellow and we need a little bit more blue. But especially for this next step, we can, it's even if it was a little bit green or purple or, or brown, I don't think that would be uh, a problem because with this step here, we're just trying to create some lines that won't disappear under subsequent layers of paint. Uh, Rosa says, great topic of inequalities within the inner sanctum of the art world. Such a great class, Michael. Thank you for saying so, Rosa. Um, uh, Deborah says, Michael Keane's work reminds me of a photo of my granddaughter with Hawaiian flowers in her hair. I think that I will paint her with Keane's style. That would be cool. Um, Pascaline says, I'm f I fancy having a go playing with decoupage text texture. The face definitely may be mine. Interesting. Look at all these different ways people are thinking of uh, approaching this painting. Deborah says, her fingers are great for playing piano or a harp. <laughs> That's true. So, let's, uh, let's see. 
Let's get started. And I'm sorry, I know there's more comments people left way up at the top of the chat there that uh, that I might, if, if, if there is a question that, that I, I haven't, or a comment that you'd like to see me address, maybe put it in the comments again, because uh, otherwise it just takes me so long to read through everything here. And I know not everybody is always talking to me, sometimes people are having conversations amongst yourselves, so, um, okay. So for this here, let's bring the original. Um, really what I just want to capture is some of the details like of her face. Uh, let's put them side by side. Oops. Oh, don't have that. Um, so let's say her chin here. Now, I'm not going to paint over everything, nor am I concerned about um, kind of precision here. This is just sort of a, uh, a way to protect some of these details from subsequent layers of paint. And I find this just allows me to, more freedom to, to be a little bit sloppier. to the splash pool and our daughter got really wet. <laughs> our daughter loves water. I think she was uh, a fish in her previous life. Okay, I'm going to blow dry that real quick.
Okay, so now that we've got we've got a little bit of underpainting done, let's move on to our next step here. Now what I want to do is tackle the background. And I think the background in this painting is relatively simple and straightforward. So let's just take a quick look at how Margaret Keane painted the background. It looks like it's just a black background. So, although, let's just... Okay, I just wanted to be sure because I saw this little bit of like a bluish green halo. That's interesting. Hmm. That makes me think... Maybe she used a bit of a blue as an imprimatura. Or maybe for part of her underpainting. Now that I see that, that's... Hmm. Do I, hmm. So I'm just trying to think to myself, do I, would that be appropriate to do here? You know, I, it's, I kind of see a little bit of a blue coming through here. So I'm just contemplating whether I want to apply like a blue layer of paint over here. Because I was pretty sure she didn't use any kind of imprimatur at all. She certainly didn't for like the her early paintings, but maybe she started doing that as she really matured as an artist after her divorce. There's some subtle blues in here. It's it is also entirely possible that she did that afterwards or as a way of building up a little bit. I think I think I'm just going to proceed as normal, but I'm going to bring that in a little bit later on. So, what I want to do is I want to cover this background with black, I think. Or do I want to put a bit of a color into that black? Let's just put the black on there. And then if we want to do something, we can always do a little bit on top of that. Now, one thing I like doing is I like painting these edges, but I also like just leaving a little bit of yellow poking through. I, I, because I like, when I go to a museum or art gallery, looking at the edge of a painting and seeing if I can see a little bit of uh, little secret information there about how the painting was constructed. And often that you can see that kind of stuff on the edge of a painting. All right, so I might just leave, I don't know if you can see that, like just little hints. You know, it's like a, I'm just leaving a couple little clues for uh, our uh, future intrepid um, investigator artist.
because, you know, I like spending time doing what we're doing here and trying to kind of work my way backwards in an artwork to see if I can uncover the methods that an artist used. And those little things, like those little clues that are left over behind are, I think, either intentionally or unintentionally are ways that um, that I engage with art, especially as an art teacher. You know, it's, it's a little bit of the same reason why people watch cooking shows on television. To kind of have a bit of an insight or understanding into how good food is made and which I think only helps you know when people have a have a greater understanding of how difficult it is to to cook a really good meal you know it makes people more willing to spend a little bit more money on good food because they it doesn't just seem like oh my goodness look at how outrageous this thing is for I could just make that at home well could you could you do how many people make their own risotto at home right so there is that yellow coming through which again I really like But the, this is also very thin, and we see a lot of those brush strokes, whereas in her version, it's just a solid black. dry that Let's look at that, this painting again, side by side. Hmm. 
I am strongly considering doing a little bit Let's, let's do something kind of fun and different. Why not, right? That's what would happen if we put a, a little bit of a blue stain across this picture. It looks like it's a bit of a warmer blue. I'm going to take a cool blue, though. So I'm going to take my cool blue. And some matte medium. So take my cool blue and matte medium. Let's blend that together. Thinner. This could be completely bonkers. Um, but why not, right? Now the one thing with using that matte medium in here is it's starting to dry very quickly and I might get a little bit of the paint kind of pulling away from the surface. So I have to kind of paint very quickly, try to avoid any textures. You know, little things build up on the surface here. Now, do I think she did this? I, I, I don't think she did this at this stage of the painting, though, for sure. See, what happens is when the paint is almost dry and then you brush over it with also dry paint on your brush, it can peel that whole paint off and reveal what was down below. So that's, that's one reason why you may want to use, let's say, a little bit of, of a slow dry medium or even glazing medium in there. Pascal asks, would it become green? Yeah, it does have a, certainly a greenish quality here. Obviously, if I was just painting on a white canvas, it wouldn't appear a little bit green. I just wanted, to, I was gonna, just going to paint that blue on the background. And I thought, well, let's just, I've done enough paintings where I've just painted directly over top of yellow. So it won't hurt to do a little bit of, try doing that over top of this blue. And I may even do another coat of that here in a moment.
so yeah, I'm going to do a bit more of this. It's just complete bonkers, but... Uh, What's the joy in life if you don't take a little risk every once in a while and do something a little unexpected? I mean, that just makes for such a strange painting to begin with. And there is a bit of strangeness in this painting. Again, I don't think she necessarily did this. But that's one of the... I, I love thinking about that with artists. Like, I think often artists are trying to... Um, challenge one another... Uh, kind of up the ante, back, you know, kind of create that conversation. Um. Uh, Pascal asks a great, uh, makes a great point here. Cool colors recede. Wouldn't we want to use cool blue for the background and warm blue for the lady? You are essentially correct. Yes, that would be. A gr I was thinking of doing something like that. I decided to just do the whole thing because uh, we have our warm yellow underneath everything, so that's always going to be kind of coming through. We have modified it with this cool blue. Um, but then I'm going to be painting all warm colors back over top of it. So it's all going to kind of balance out in the wash, and especially because our background is so relatively generic that I'm not so concerned with managing kind of those uh, more those color temperature relationships. If, however, let's say the background, instead of just being black, it had a landscape with trees and stuff, then, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I mean, I probably would have done this whole painting very differently, but yeah, I would have painted that as a warmer blue over top to really make sure that there was not a confusion between warm and cool colors. So, you are, you're, you, you, um, <laughs> you did a great job of, of paying very close attention to the things that I talk about, so I appreciate that. We, nice job. Uh, let's see. I'm going to 
put more matte medium in my black. So this is going to make the black a little bit more transparent. It's also going to extend it. I mean, I could have mixed more here. Uh, but I also was like, well, what's the point? If I just do that, it's going to cover up all this blue I just put here. So what this is going to do is just make it a little bit easier to see the little bit of blue coming through here. Uh, and so already I can feel, because of these various different layers of paint on here, that my background and probably the rest of this canvas is, is very smooth. Right? And I love painting on smooth surfaces. I find it a lot easier, especially if you're doing detail. Not everybody feels that way. Some people really like textured surface. And I'd say if you're painting more abstract paintings, you may prefer a much more textured surface, especially if you're painting really thick paint. If you're painting really thick gobs of paint on your picture, having uh, texture is literally going to help keep that paint from falling off the surface. And the same, because you know, essentially you're gluing textured paint onto the surface and uh, it needs something to stick just in the same way that if you're gluing two things together you may want to sand them and give it a little bit of texture scratch it up scuff it up so that it sticks really well so this is cool I can already see the as the paint dries a little bit, a bit of that blue poking through. A bit of blue a poking through. So, I mean, another strategy would have been to just add blue to this black. I decided to do it in, in individual layers instead, however, um, because there's more likelihood of a bit of that blue kind of just shining through as opposed to it being a, a bluish black, which is similar, but not the same. You know, it's, um, how is, what is an analogy for that? It's a little bit like, the difference between, <laughs> like, having a breakfast where you have eggs, toast, and bacon, and hash browns, versus putting it all in a blender, blending it up. Technically, it's exactly the same thing, <laughs> but one might seem more appealing to eat than the other, right? Because I know some people like to eat, you know, all the, all the egg all by itself, and then eat the hash browns, and then eat, you know, very compartmentalized. Some people like to put a couple of each on there, but, you know, it's just so, yeah. Just, just got some texture up here. I might. We'll see how that dries. It's kind of too dry for me to now kind of go in there because otherwise I might mess that up. So I have to just let that dry and then I can focus on that later. But what is nice? Even when this is still wet, I just see this, you know, it's one of those things where you look at it and you're like, how, would, how, would, how did they do that? And I, a lot, I think 
every artist, once you get to a certain point, wants to have those conversations with other artists, of other artists who know how to paint, looking at it like, wait a second, Margaret, what did you do to, how, how did you get, ah, artist never tells their secrets. You're like, ah, hmm. You know, it's, you know, like you find a good chef who's got a secret sauce or recipe. You, you let everybody else try to create their own version of it, right? Think about how much uh, Coca-Cola or KFC protect their secret recipes. <laughs> Pascal says, uh, or is it like adding ketchup to a burger rather than mixing it into the meat? Kind of, yeah. One is a hamburger and one is meatloaf, right? <laughs> yeah, that's another great analogy here. I'm just going to quickly blow dry. Uh, Pascaline says she's glowing, yeah, glowing in the dark at the moment, right? Okay, so um, this is great. Definitely a bit of a twist so far, but those are, that makes me happy. You know, sometimes it's nice just to throw a little wrench into your process and then see what happens, right? And painting, what's what I love about painting is it's a safe place to try and experiment, do something wild and unexpected. Worse comes to worse, and it doesn't work out, you learn a really valuable lesson. And if you can make a bad painting but learn a valuable lesson, then it is worth 10 great paintings. I would trade one mistake that taught me an, an important lesson that I'll never forget, then make 10 great paintings I'm really happy with. I know it's for some people it sounds ridiculous. Like I would take those ten paintings in a in a, in a heartbeat. Yeah, but then what happens when you want to do something a little bit unusual? Well, you don't. You still have no idea, and it and you're either never going to take a risk, never going to learn, never progress, because you'll be always afraid of what would happen if if you did something a little bit out of the out of the um, playbook, I guess. Okay. Now let's move on to the foreground and let's start painting some skin tones, hair, clothing. And really there's, because Margaret Keene has left us with a relatively simple background, which I somehow managed to complicate, really we can spend the, the rest of this painting working on those details. And it, of course, Margaret, I'm sure spent probably days painting that skin and her face we're not going to do that we're going to try to do this all in the next uh, maybe two or hours or so <laughs> um but uh it is a, it is some in some ways a relief it's like oh man imagine we had to do this and then there was like a ferris wheel or something in behind her oh i'd be like planning my breakfast <laughs> already right okay so um, what should we do first here? I think... Let's look at some side by side. Um, let's start with her skin tones. And, and that will give us a pretty clear idea how, uh, you know, this greenish blue underneath everything is going to behave 
for the rest of the painting. I think probably a lot of it is going to disappear because we're about to mix a skin tone that has a lot of white in it. Now we can always dilute that white by adding matte medium or glazing fluid or slow dry medium. Um, so it's just up to us how much white we put in here and that's that would make a huge difference. So I'm going to mix a skin tone as I normally do, but I might just sort of dilute it a little bit so that we keep a bit of that color reappearing through subsequent layers. So this is going to be a couple of layers of, of color for her skin. So to start with, we're going to add, maybe I'll make a bigger batch here. Um, I'm starting with my warm yellow. And then I'm going to take some warm red and mix this together into an orange. So you can see I just started with a relatively small amount of red. In fact, maybe I'm going to put a little bit more. But still, you know, that might have been, what would you say, maybe 80% yellow, 10% at most red. And then I'm going to add some warm blue. And now that warm blue is maybe 5% warm blue into this mixture. Maybe, maybe add a little bit more. So blue is going to take that orange and turn it into a brown. Now her skin color is really delicate. So let's now take this color and add now a lot of white. In fact, maybe I should just do that separately here. still needs to go even lighter. Okay, I think that's pretty close. bit of matte medium into here to make the paint just a little bit more transparent so when I start because now I've got maybe 90% white and that white on its own is so strong that you know I'm afraid it's gonna completely obliterate any of the green and blue underneath so that's why I just keep on adding a bit more medium in here Okay, let's get a smaller brush out. But, you know, <laughs> uh, Kathy says maybe she's an alien. So, you know, the, the reason why I, beyond trying to get, approximate maybe a little bit of what Margaret Keene is doing here, the reason why I put a little bit of this, um, put a couple of, of, uh, thin layers of blue over top of that yellow and now I got this green is also to show you that you know if let's say this next 20 minutes of painting just goes catastrophically wrong and I just lose the plot altogether 
it'll be okay. I will survive. The painting is potentially, I mean, I think the, the likelihood of it being a complete loss is very low. I think, uh, and I, because I, I, I've seen in the comments from times people like, one of the things they like about these videos is when I make mistakes, as, as I tend to do, people can see how I recover from those mistakes. And that can be um, helpful because sometimes, you know, other people might show you how, it, how to do it right, but they don't show you how to do it wrong and then make it right. So where should we start? Let's, uh, let's start with her neck here. Okay, so this poses if we're probably going to do a few layers of this. This doesn't surprise me that what's happening here is because there's darker paint underneath, we're going to get these kind of streaky qualities. The other thing too is like I've never gone done this kind of thing to a painting before, so it's also you know a learning experience for myself to see like well well what would happen if we did this? Worst comes to worse, I'm not happy with it, and I want to do a different approach. And I would imagine probably a number of people watching are like, yeah, I probably am not going to do that. I mean, you could certainly approach this painting exactly the way we approached the previous painting we did last class.
Now there were artists that did use, let's say a blue impanimatura as a foundational layer for portraits. Um, so doing what we're doing here is not totally out of left field. In fact, maybe I should think about um, doing an episode that deliberately approaches the painting in the same sort of way. I mean, she looks kind of ghostly at the moment with this kind of sickly quality of, the, of her skin like that. Should I do another layer of that? Let's blow dry it, and while I'm blow drying, I'll think about it. Um, Lori says, I made it. I love this painting. I've tried many times to paint it. And I've tried many times, lol. I've never thought, though, to put down a layer of yellow and blue. That's brilliant. <laughs> well, hold your, uh, your praise. <laughs> we shall see. Um, so as I was blow drying, I was thinking, well, maybe I should just paint another coat of this, uh, semi-transparent skin tone but then the thing is is it's mostly going to just get rid of all of that blue and that might be kind of like a relief <laughs> but it would also sort of defeat the purpose of having done that taking that little bit of a detour so i think what i'm going to do is i'm going to start i'm going to put in some color for her shirt and hair and then we'll we'll kind of circle back around, because also it, I I don't know how this painting is really looks right now, because that green, bluey green is so intense, right? So alien, as Kathy said, right? So let's uh, let's 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 get the painting closer in its totality. To where it needs to be before we obsess over one area only. So let's look at her hair here. I, I think what we want to do is maybe start with a darker brown and we're going to leave the lighter streaks for later. So I think we could even probably just take a bit of this brown we used before and apply that over. And so this is a brown that has a little bit of white in it. I mean, ideally it would have very little to none. Um, I'm debating... No, let's just use this. That's fine. I was, well, maybe is that going to cover everything up too much? Let's just use it. Let's just get on with it, Michael. I think there's probably going to be a bit of paint come through here anyway. Or the, the blue will come through there a bit. I mean... Now 
And let's zoom in here. So this is again why I put this painting in with maybe the more complex paintings because you know it's we're using more complex techniques materials uh, such as matte medium or glazing fluid but I'm, I'm also maybe unnecessarily complicating this painting because just out of my own sense of curiosity, wanting to kind of see what would happen. So I'm, I'm expecting to see other people attempt this painting um, and maybe not kind of go in such a um, roundabout way as I'm here. I mean, you know, probably would have been nice if there there is a there's white in that color, and in retrospect, it maybe would have been nice to have done that brown a little bit, like just with just a brown without white in there. I just got a little bit lazy and just used the paint that's uh, still on my palette. But already that changes things. It already looks different, right? Putting getting more more of these details on that face. Now let's do her dress. Oh, now actually I'm looking at how did she let's let's uh hmm It almost looks like she painted that skin tone over top of the dress and then painted the dress over top of the skin tone. Because we, hmm. This paint is full of a lot of surprises here. How... Do I want to do that? Does that make sense to paint a skin tone over? Hmm. 
Maybe. Well, well, let's do it. Let's, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're already way off the path. So let's continue. Okay. So where she hasn't painted anything was over the shoulders where we see. So I just left a little bit of the greenish blue exposed on the shoulders where she did as well. My goodness, we are I'm, I'm, I feel like a little bit lost in the wilderness here at this stage. So I just painted, I just added a little bit of matte medium and some white to paint those eyes. I painted the skin tone on her lips as well. I did not think <laughs> this painting would look the way it does now. I probably, you know, yeah. I mean, I could have painted, we could be much further along if I had just decided to go take the straightforward direction. But 
for me right now, this is a like a big learning lesson. Trying something, but never really done this before. I, I'm pretty confident it'll work out, but it I can I can certainly understand if anyone was painting along with me or doing this on their own and arrived at this place, you'd, I, I would I would bet probably a lot of people would would just throw this painting in the trash at this moment. So what I want to show over the next couple of hours is how we can take this and either rescue it or bring it to a resolution, depending on the way how you might feel at this moment. Because I know often people get to a, a stage in a painting and they're just like, oh my goodness, what have I done? This is, oh goodness gracious. Oh, I, I should just, I should do something else besides painting because this is a disaster. And it's just, I think it's important to take a deep breath because we don't see really any paintings ever like this at this stage in a museum or on a website, an art gallery. Most artists would be horrified if people saw this step in the same stage that most people would be horrified to walk into a slaughterhouse and see what's happening behind closed doors, right? You just want to eat the sausage afterwards. You don't really want to know what happened behind the scenes. And um, same sort of thing. You're kind of getting a little bit of a sneak peek into how the sausage is made here. And that can be kind of scary <laughs> just to mix all my metaphors together. So to have no fear. I think we're, we'll, we'll be fine by the end of the painting but it just might not be, you know, this stage might be a little bit too far off the edge for most people. So let's blow dry this and move on. Uh, Lisa says, I'm positive your ending results will look great. It's fun to watch. And Mary says, I just started watching your beginner's drawing course. You are an amazing teacher. Thank you so much, Mary. That's so sweet of you to say. I really appreciate that. Um, okay. So I think what I want to do now is I want to just paint her dress a little bit. Put some of that black paint on here. Uh, before I move on and go back to her, her face and hands, etc. Again, it's it, one of the 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 pitfalls though of this process is any pencil lines that were once here are long gone. Right, and that's mostly because we've added white into all of these colors. So that white obliterates everything below. So I could that be another reason why this type of situation would just terrify people. Is they're just like, yeah, well, I might be able to to apply the paint well enough to make it look like skin, but the facial features are just going to be completely off the, you know. Not, not, it's not going to look anything like the original, which, you know, I could understand why that might be upsetting, but I'm also not worried in making it like a perfect reproduction of the original. I'm more interested in learning some lessons and growing as an artist. As satisfying as it might be to make a perfect reproduction, would does would that make me really feel like I? grew as an artist when I when I feel pretty confident there there's ways that I could paint this where 
it would be I'd have a reasonably good chance of doing um, making it look like the original anyway let's I'm gonna take a matte medium here and I'm gonna get my brush with the matte medium remember matte medium is just a clear acrylic paint it's it's what's in acrylic paint but just has no pigment in it so it'll dry about like 90 9% clear. Now I'm going to take a little bit of my black that I mixed and mix this in here. One of the things that she's done when she painted this is used a bit of a dry brush technique, which is, which can be kind of tricky. Uh, we could do this whole thing with dry brush. But I'm going to maybe start with a bit of a semi-transparent layer. Let's see, is that too thin? I think that's okay. So let's, let's start here. You can see it's got a slight purplish quality there. Um, not really, doesn't bother me too much. Um, let's blow dry that. So let's uh, let's take some more black. I'm gonna get a bit of my my uh, matte medium on there. It's not so dark. And then let's uh, I'm gonna do a little bit of darkening
rid of that line that I made from that original layer there. Blow dry that quickly.
so it should just show like the paint that I'm using here is getting quite dry right so the you know it's I have a little bit of wet paint that immediately comes off the brush and the rest of it is like kind of a little bit um, well it's 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 basically sort of like I'm cleaning my brush off on the canvas So it is a little bit tricky. Like you see this little bit of a line here that's kind of formed, right? And that's just because of, you know, subsequent thin layers of paint and because dry brush technique is, is never quite as precise as you want it to be. Okay, I think I'll leave that like that for now. <laughs> Where was, uh, Lori says, I'm gonna have to finish this weekend and paint along in digital and see if I can get some, somewhere with it, I thought. She was an elf, but alien fits too. LOL. Have a great weekend, everyone. And then Lori says, and I say that, but I watch another five minutes. <laughs> That's me at like one in the morning when I'm about to fall. Well, just five more minutes, and I'm just gonna finish this show, and then uh, then I'll go then I'll go to sleep. And then well, okay, well. Oh, after the next episode, that, that's okay. As soon as this one is done, that, and then okay, well, I'm almost done the first season i mean i might i mean i mean who wants to just tune in and watch the final i mean i should really just finish this and then you know it's like that uh, portlandia thing where it's like one week later finished the whole series and it's like oh, i've got fired from work um okay is that still I, I, yeah, let's blow dry that real quick. Okay, so let's um, let's start a different uh, pass here. Now that the painting is well established, let's start refining it. We got all the colors in roughly the right place, and we'll see how this approach, as we've taken so far, ultimately pays off. I will say, even just painting in that uh, the the color of her skin, or of the dress, I mean, helps kind of bring it back into some approximation of reality here. Uh, that we kind of may, you know, an hour ago when it was all green, we were like, oh my goodness, what have we done? So now it's starting to come back into focus. Now, of course, we've lost all our pencil lines, so that presents 
all sorts of other kinds of issues, but I think we're, we're going to be fine. I do think it's, it, it's likely that I might go back over uh, the background and tidy a few things up as I get closer there, because trying to, you know, do the the um, rendering of her skin might mean I overlap the background a little bit, and um, I might have to clean that up, you know, like little areas down here by the elbow, for instance. But we'll pass that bridge or cross it when we get there. So let's do the skin tone next. Or just work on her, let, let's see. Let's work on an arm. So, the reason I'm, I'm starting here is I can experiment on part of the body that, you know, maybe is not the most immediately visible kind of part of the body. I mean, people are probably not going to go, well, oh, this is a great painting. Let's zoom right in on her right arm, I guess it is. Right? They're like, this might be the last place people look. So those are great places to experiment. You know, the same sort of thing if you buy clothes and before you wash it, the tag might say, try the detergent on the underside of the dress or the hem just before you put it on everything. Because if everything goes wrong, you're kind of out of luck. So let's go to some darker skin tones here. So here's our the light color that we previously used. Let's um let's take a little bit of let's go darker. And this time I'm going to use some glazing fluid, this satin glazing fluid, which means matte glazing fluid. You can also see it has a slow drying extender, which slows the drying time down and allows me to buff that color and, and blend it a little bit. Or, worse comes to worse, I can wipe it off because it's still wet, which is unlike most other acrylics, right, where it's just kind of, it's dark and you kind of deal with it. Or it's, it's there, like, that matte medium has no slow drying mechanism in it, and therefore once it's dry, once you, basically, seconds after applying it, it is, it's there, and you gotta, you've now got to, um, incorporate it, or make it work, people, make it work, as Tim Gunn likes to say, alright, from Project Runway. So, skin tone could be a little bit more reddish. It's a little, it looks a little yellow on camera. But that's okay. We're gonna still got lots of work to do. So I'm happy with that. I'm going to keep on going. I'm not going to get too worked up about it not being kind of uh, peachy enough.
that definitely looks way more yellow on camera, or at least on my TV here than I... The other thing too is even if I'm not happy with this and I've painted a little bit here, rather than be like, ah, okay, I can't, I gotta deal with it. Well, then let's keep on going. Let's do, we have to kind of uh, keep moving forward and apply that same color elsewhere in here, like over her face and her neck, her other arm, etc. Because if we don't, then we might be able to get, you know, we, we might, let's say we, we, we do the rest of the, the body exactly the way we want. Well, then you're going to have this situation where you've got, let's say the, everything else perfect, but then that one arm is going to be all kind of weird because it's, uh, it was done with a totally different process. So we want it all to, to work together. Okay. Well, I mean, let's just take a quick little zoom out. Okay, let's, um, I'm going to do this again, but let's, again, let's now take some warm red and put this in here. I almost worry that's now going too far in the other direction, but all we have to do is just add more glazing medium in here. That's going to dilute that color. I do want to make sure though I blow dry this because if I just start going over top of it, I might peel that up and then, oh my goodness, I think you might be unhappy with the painting now. Oof. So any, yeah, anytime you use glazing fluid, anything with a slow dry medium, uh, you, or even just regular acrylic paint, if it's, um, it's a good idea to let that layer dry before you start painting over top of it. Otherwise, the way acrylic paint is, it just sort of peels the previous layer off. Okay, so let's uh, zoom back in here. Okay, I'm just going to, again, go back to this arm. Let's start nice and slow.
And look at that. Oh, because it doesn't appear quite... In fact, maybe... I'm just going to brush that over everything. I like how that looks. So, I'm just going to take this color. What is wild is that already the painting starts to, is looking like really wildly complex. Like someone looking at it, especially another artist, is like, whoa, how did you get those, you know, I see some blues, I see greens, I see pinks, I see yellows. What, how on earth did you do this painting? Us artists love that. So now this is much closer. I mean, it's not going to be exactly my skin tone, but it's we're getting some warmth back. I think it still looks quite yellow on camera, but it's more of a peachy quality that approximates a little bit of what we see in here. And it's still a little, it's definitely more yellow than what we see on the left, but I'm gonna, what I wanna do is, I think my next step, I wanna go back with the original, maybe even add a little, well, I don't wanna add too much white because then again, it'll obl obliterate what's below. But I think what I'm going to do now is go into some of the highlights, I think. Mm, I'm not sure what I want to do next. Let's blow dry this and I'll think. So I'm going to take this color and just, since I went over the whole body with it, I'm going to go back. Oops, that's pretty thick. And just apply it where it's um, most needed. And you know, I mean, I can see the the uh, you know the the counter showing views, and they're going up and down. I see people tune in, and then they're like, "Yikes! What on earth? this? Especially new people. This guy's no idea what he's doing," which might be true, but um, um, 
you know, I think people want to see it go maybe more straightforward, and they don't like to see uh, it not uh, proceeding in the way they might expect it to proceed. Okay. Well, let's blow dry that. So what I want to do now is I want to go the opposite. We've been kind of darkening and darkening, getting pinker and peachy and yellow. Let's go for uh, the, the much more white side of this spectrum here. So let's take some white all by itself. Put lots of glazing medium in there. I'm even just wondering about just painting white directly. I mean, I didn't wash my brush because I was expecting to put a little bit of color in there. I have this probably like four to one glazing medium and white in here. You can see that's, that's actually way more opaque than I expected. Even with that little amount of white, that's... this brush. I'm, I'm not, she's really surprised how white that is. Well, it's still pretty white, but you know what? I think just if I was, if I had like unlimited amount of time to paint this, I would dilute this and then and and um, build up slowly. But I think I want to just uh, plow ahead here, and, and um, we'll make it work. So, let's once again, let's start in the middle. Let's get a brush to buff that out. start seeing it kind of 
coming back to closer and closer to the original. So we, we went off that precipice. And for some deliberate, I mostly deliberately did that. Um, and some other people may also have deliberately gone over the precipice with me or just accidentally found themselves going over the edge, right? But now we're coming back. Okay, let's blow dry that and then keep on going. We're, we're, gonna, we're now leaving some of these edges a little bit more on the peachy side and we're gonna get whiter and whiter. I mean, we could keep, and I'm not gonna go fully white because I, I wanna then do the hair and the clothes and then come back, but we're, we'll get close. Let's take more of our white here.
Okay, I'm just going to do one more layer of white. Or, well, it's slightly white. Mostly white. And it's also been muted or diluted with matte or uh, glazing fluid, right?
That's where my impatience comes through. Just let, okay, I'm just gonna blow dry that. So, you know, it does seem like a bit of a, certainly a roundabout way to get to that place. Um, but what I've, I'm happy with is that I have the same sort, like, as I'm looking at it, I don't just see white here. I don't just see kind of a gray, I see, like, all these colors coming through. Maybe it doesn't show up on camera so well. But, you know, there's a lot of artists that talk about, like, I remember I had a college teacher whose whole thing was like, my whole painting process is about defying photography, making something that doesn't photograph well. I mean, probably a reason why you don't really know who, who've never, you would never have heard of him. Because if you're, you know, especially in the day and age we live in, if you can't photograph your work, good luck getting it out in the world. Not everybody goes to museums or art galleries. But he was from a totally different world and generation, for sure. We did not get, see eye to eye on basically anything. <laughs> um, but uh, what should we do now? What would be a good idea? I think we should continue with the skin, this time getting darker. I think it would probably be sad. I think probably people tuning in are like, oh, 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 or a big mess with the face. So probably would be a good idea to tackle that. So let's zoom in. You can even see I've kind of lost a bit of the shape of her face through all those different layers. So we'll br that's part of the, the next stage here is to kind of bring some of that likeness back. Let's see. Let's go. I think, you know what, before I even start putting in some darker colors... Actually, you know what? Let's let's go to a, a let's take our black. Um, let's take some of that. Let's take our skin tone.
Has anyone seen Oppenheimer or Barbie? We're done the the Barbieheimer. <laughs> I haven't seen either. My my hope is is that I'll finish up here in the next two hours and be able to walk up the street and see a movie. You let me know if uh, which one you think is is must see and which one I should avoid. Or if they're both uh, recommended. So, you know, I've, I've lost my pencil lines through here. So now what I'm doing is relying on my knowledge of portraiture and to help me. So easier said than done, but you can do my entire free drawing course here on YouTube. And that might help you. Well, it would absolutely help you if you found yourself in the same situation, having lost all these facial features. Okay, so that's a good start on the face. Let's uh, tackle these hands and bring some life back there.
have I done here? So I have to make that that pinky finger needs to be shorter than all those other fingers, so maybe I just didn't make them all long enough? I don't know. Let's come up here to her jaw. Also to her collarbone.
Okay, I should blow dry everything because we got a bunch of stuff in a state of slight wetness and because I've got this um, glazing fluid that has a slow dry quality to it that, that slows the, the paint from drying. If I want to do anything to it, I got to make sure that's all nice and dry. go back to this um, kind of peachy color, um, reddish color, bring that back again. Let's go right towards her face. Oops, I'm not even in the middle, am I? Of course not. Okay, let's keep that. Let's just go back to her body here. I'm gonna put the same color. Back onto her arms.
color into the shadows. That's that's turning out great. Still ways to go, but it's coming in back into focus. Let's do that again, but I'm going to get more red in here.
put too much. Might be pushing this a bit far. Okay. So, who everyone who thought we were lost, right? We're we're basically back in business. We're not done. But, you know, any of the kind of fears of, of being complete, of having ruined the painting, I, I think should be gone. And I'm both talking to anybody watching and also to myself. I mean, because every artist, there's so many emotions that happen when you're making a painting. And there's lots of highs and you're excited. Things are going exactly what you want. And then sometimes you're just like, oh, oh my goodness, what on earth have I done? Like, what did I just do there? Smudged something. Um, so just knowing that we could kind of get back to where we began or... Um, to a place that we feel more comfortable with if, if you know just by taking a little bit of a deep breath and um, maybe trying to strategize how to get out of it you're never sort of stuck worst comes to worst we could have just painted white over this whole thing start it all over again um, okay let's take a sip of tea 
And as well, again, you know, this is this is different. The, the painting looks different than had I just gone in, in the more straightforward manner that I, maybe I did in the previous episode. There is still kind of like... Like, if I was looking at this trying to figure out how it was made, it would definitely cause, it would be... You know, and I didn't know how, <laughs> the steps I did, especially if I'm just looking at the skin, it would be tricky, which is sort of what... When I look at Margaret Keane's version, it's like... I mean, I think I've actually done a pretty good job approximating her technique thus far. Um, and so it's entirely possible that I just pulled a painting out that happened to be using a, a, maybe a bit more of an advanced technique. Because like any artist, you know, they, they're they influenced by different things. Maybe somebody comes into her studio and says, have you ever tried using like a blue imprimatur? And she might be like, I've never, what's an imprimatur? I've never even heard of it. She's like, oh, well, maybe you should look at the paintings of Leonardo and, and look at some of, the, and she's like, Oh, okay. Well, I didn't think I could paint a painting like that. Then she kind of takes a little bit of that technique and starts employing it in her paintings. And then, boom, something a new. She learns something. And maybe she's like, wow, that's great. I'm going to use that all the time. Or like, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's. I'm, I've been there, done that, check that off the bucket list, never going back there. All right, so. Uh, where should we go next? Speaking of moving on, I think uh, let's go back to her dress now. Now that we've got more of this painting coming together in terms of the skin. Actually, maybe let's, just before I do that, let's put some blue into her eyes. That's a tricky color. What is that's like a it's a I think a little bit of both. That's like a cobalt blue. So let's take some warm blue and cold blue. And a little bit of white. Oops, I don't want to zoom that in, I want to zoom this in. I want to blow dry this. Okay, I think what I want to do now 
is add a little bit of blue into her face. So I'm taking my glazing fluid and a little bit of blue, very subtle. I want a nice dry brush. Super subtle.
go down to these hands now. Okay, maybe, maybe I'm going to use this same color here to subtly start to define this dress a bit more.
So there's some white there that I need to overpower. It just keeps shining through, so painting some diluted black directly in there. Now obviously there's this like little fold in, in her shirt there, that frill. I wasn't able to get that. I have to just sort of move on without it. I mean I could, but it, it would, it's probably more trouble than it's worth, honestly. went a little farther. I mean, I could just use a cloth and wipe all that away, but it's not that important to me.
Okay, I think um, I'm gonna just gonna plow ahead with her clothes. I'm gonna add black glazing fluid. I've been taking a little bit of uh, warm blue and cool blue. And we're just going to speed up this. Uh,
Okay. Okay. Um, let's just clean some brushes. So let's go. Now that we've got really the most of the skin d done, frankly, most of the dress done, I really want to just now focus on the hands, face, and hair. And maybe there's a little finishing touch here or there, but um, I think once we define the eyes, which is such a, obviously a big part of Margaret Keane's work, that will go a long way to, I think, get feeling like the painting's a lot further along. So let's start right there. Let's go right into those eyes. Kathy says, this looks great. I'm just watching now. I'll finish tomorrow, I hope. <laughs> um, So, uh, what we want to do is start putting some kind of much darker lines around the eyes. And that's going to go a long way to kind of bringing her personality out. Because right now it's, it's you know, a lot of like, yeah, it's kind of ambiguous here. So, how about, I always kind of like starting with the top eyelid.
then let's go for her irises. Pupils. Okay, so now um, I'm going to just take, uh, let's take some of our flesh tone. It's like a brown. I'll take a little bit of that black. I just want something that's not quite as dark. Dark, but not, not black. In fact, you know what? I should blow dry that.
So what I just did there is made her jaw a little bit more angular. I kind of just went over the previous line, which was a little bit more round. And there's, you know, nothing wrong with that. Um, uh, I'm a bit round myself. Um, but uh, this other side, which I've kind of defined already a little bit more, was more angular. And that's something I've been... Um, keeping an eye on a little mental note for later. Blow dry that. And there's Sanju has entered the chat. Says, uh, thanks for your review on Sunday. You're welcome. Maybe you're the one doing the hard work. I'm so grateful to just to be able to help my fellow artists on their creative journeys. And so, very inspiring what you're doing, especially with those children. That's very cool. Um, okay, so another thing that I'm doing, um, I'm starting to do now, is looking at my painting and the original and squinting my eyes. So I'm pretending to kind of like sleep. Like I'm just barely able to see out my eyes because of my eyelashes are covering most of my eye. And I look at mine and then I look at the original back and forth. And what that does is it removes all the details and just lets me see the contrast between light and dark. And when I do that, it helps me see how close or far away I am to capturing the contrast, the, the, the differences in value. And, and again, value is the difference 
is how we measure light and dark in a drawing. Besides money, that's another way of measuring um, uh, you know, of, of value in art. But um, uh, it, the, the, the word in art is all about dark and light. So, you know, when I look at these side by side, you know, I feel like the eyes themselves are dark enough but I need to get a little bit darker around the, um, you know, in the eye, uh, eyebrows a bit. I want to get those the blue of those irises down again. So I made pretty big dark blue lines here. Now I'm oops, I'm just gonna be careful I don't smudge all that. So I'm kind of thinning out. Those blue lines.
Sanju says, you're doing amazing work creating all of this content. You're an inspiring teacher. The first time I painted on a canvas using acrylic was in February this year. Uh, and Kathy says um, correctly, I like how you are teaching the kids to paint too. Great job, Sanju. Sanju says, yeah, the arts book in school is very poor. I like Mikey's style of teaching. I wish someone had taught that to me when I was in school. Maybe life would have been different. Well, you know, it's never too late. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of artists that start very, very late. You know, one of the, the, the most famous examples of all time is Grandma Moses. And we did do a painting by Grandma Moses. She was an American artist. She did take art classes when she was younger. But it wasn't until she was in her 70s that she really began to make art again, seriously. And so she's always brought up as an example of an artist who who really ultimately kind of, yeah, started late. Like, long after her children had moved out and she had retired, she all of a sudden, she had grandchildren. It was when she kind of felt, she, oh, okay, now I got some time to myself, finally. So one of the things I did there is um, is I brought the, the curve of that blue back. Maybe it's almost easier just to do a quick little sketch. Because uh, this is just a little trick of mine for dealing with eyes when, you're, when you've maybe lost the plot a little bit. So let's say I've got my eye like that. Oops. Um, the eye's gonna look like it's looking up. If there's space, so let's say here's the pupil, there's the iris. The eye is gonna look like it's looking upwards if there's any space under here. I mean, there can be a little bit, and often there is, but. Ideally, you want this bottom eyelid to be touching the iris. That's going to make the eye look like it's looking forward as opposed to looking upward. All right, so the other thing is, is I had kind of painted the pupil like that. And that, again, makes it look like we're looking up. So what I just did is I took my paint, my blue paint, and painted back in and around, maybe I'll just take some. All right, I took my paint and I went back in there like that. And to help bring that circle of the pupil back into play. Because if the pupil is like that, it looks again like if that, if all we see, maybe the difference, oh, what's the best way to draw this? Right, if it's if if it looks like a semicircle, then it's going to be looking up. 
once we see a bit of the the edge of that that uh, circle, it looks like it's looking, it's coming, the eye is coming back down. I don't know if that makes any sense, but it's something that I've learned just from <laughs> making lots of mistakes. Um, and so that again brings her focus back down again. That it was she, her eyes were starting to drift up, and I had to kind of go in and make that little change. I mean, there, again, there's nothing wrong with her eyes looking upwards, and there's famous paintings where where people are doing just that. But I think one of the features of this painting is that. She's looking right at us. About to start the hair here in a moment. I just want to darken the area around her neck. You know what, maybe before I, I, I push on and just leave skin mostly for good in the back in the review mirror, let's um, try to get these hands a little bit closer to com completion here. I, you know, there's, I, I, yeah, there's all the, the knuckles, yeah, and the joints. I just, uh, I'm getting a little leery with time here. Um...
Okay. Uh, let's uh, let's mix. mix of brown. So let's take, how, how dark is her hair? It's a blonde, right? Okay. So let's take our warm yellow. A little bit of cool red. Tiny bit of blue. Although, let's make another brown over here. Darker brown. So the first thing I'm going to do is take this dark brown. And you know what? It looks like she's put a little bit of... She's muted it, sorry, with a little bit of black. Maybe not quite as dark as this color. But... I was going to say, I'll do it anyway, but what's the point of... Uh, so here, I just put a bit of more uh, warm yellow. These are all warm colors, by the way, too. And let's start... Uh, in fact, I think I need to go back out a bit. I'm not too concerned about uh, making really nice pretty lines with this color because everything's going to get covered up here. Well, not everything, but a lot of it.
Okay, where else here? I'm not really looking at the original, which some of you are like, yeah, I can tell. Um, I'm just kind of having fun putting some of these lines in, and I kind of I want them to kind of complement one another, and then sometimes contradict one another. Otherwise, it's going to look like um, really weird and artificial. So that may even be darker than it, it really should have been or needed to be, but um, I'm also going to take a little bit of blue and warm yellow and make it green and add a bit of red to that. Because one of the things I see that she's done here is, is almost like a bit of a greenish blue or greenish brown, I mean. medium just to give it a little bit of extra fluidity instead of water.
So her hair kind of looks a little bit more on the brunette side of things at the moment. So we're, we're now need to uh, brighten it up with some white and uh, warm yellow. Oops. So this is warm yellow with white, and there's probably a little bit uh, still of warm red and stuff deep in here. Maybe even just a 1% of warm blue that has stuck around. And there's John entering the chat. Hi, John. I was going to blow dry it, but you know what? I think we can just plow ahead, and if the colors mix a little bit, that's okay. The one thing I just want to be careful, I don't smear anything. With my hand, I mean.
One thing I like about this painting is kind of the frizziness of her hair. Just those like little bit, of, well, I don't know about frizzy, but just like loose strands all over the place. Now those are just maybe a little bit too small for me to paint without it looking like really messy. Without, for, but I think it's just, that's a really nice attention to detail. And quite frankly, it might be something that, that like a male artist might have excluded. As being kind of, you know, uh, something that was um, maybe less polished or something, but you know, everybody's hair never quite looks perfect. It's always a few extra little hairs that are not laying f as flat as maybe we would wish. See, I almost feel like that's too much. Okay, so right now she's definitely, she's got more of like that, what, strawberry blonde hair. We need to make it more uh, yellowy and less orangey. So now what we'll do is we're going to start using some cool yellow. So take the cool yellow and white. So this paint, a lot of this paint is quite sticky and chunky and dry. Probably shouldn't have put as much paint on here to start. Um, I'm, I'm going to take a little bit of the previous color and blend that in just so we have a little extra step in between.
put a little bit of warm red in here. Let's take a little bit of of blue. Again, that just gives it a bit slight greenish quality.
So the, the process of built of doing this hair is um, a little bit slow and time consuming. We're making a kind of a bit of a gray. Because now that I've got the hair like this, what I want to start doing is just now doing little details into the hair. So rather than painting kind of strands of hair, now I want to think about like where it's getting darker, where it's lightening up. I'm kind of partially painting over some of the brown. Now, I'm going to take a little bit of cool blue and get a little bit of a, a green going on here. So it's not a, at least not yet, like a bright saturated green. It's just, it's fairly subtle. And of course we want to be careful we don't overdo it. Just done a bit.
So it's interesting, as I was painting, as I was mixing that color, I was thinking, well, I'm going to have to definitely do a few more, much more saturated greens. And then I get that, and I'm like, ooh, it's, oh, it gets, gets kind of almost clown level here. So I want to go kind of back the other way. Let's take some of our earlier colors. Because we want to kind of create like a, a web where it's not just building color on color on color. Sometimes we put some of the previous colors back up on top. And this is the kind of thing that, these are the places in a painting where I just want to spend all day. Okay, and then now let's take, actually it's mostly white, let's just take mostly white, what color that was again, let's just thin that out, get some more white.
Okay, I, probably, I could do this all day long. I think I'm going to wrap it up here in just a second. So we're almost done. There's a few little finishing touches that I want to do, like highlights in the eyes, maybe just do it a little on the fingers. I don't know about the fabric, if I'm just if I could just leave it like that. Um maybe some eyelashes. So let's um Let's look at the eyes. Let's um, let's take a little bit of white. Why is, this, why is this moving around like this these days? There we go. That immediately gives some life. Look how looks like an earthquake or something. Why is the camera shaking like that? Do you see that? Usually we usually doesn't shake like that. I wonder what's going on. So that l just that little bit of highlight also goes a long way to, to bring life back um, into those eyes. I also want to take, I'm going to take my black again. So I'm going to take just a little bit more white. 
And some glazing fluid. And maybe I'm just going to take a little bit of my skin tone that I have left over. This is not pure, pure white. But close enough. So that I can do a few final little highlights here. Go down to these fingers.
Hmm. His fingers look a little bit now too white. Do I have any... It's going to put a bit of color back in there. Just try to scrape any last little bits of Well, I think we can move on here. Okay, everybody, I think we are ready to say goodnight to another painting. Of course, if you're just uh, watching for the very first time, please consider liking, subscribing, hitting the notification bell. We're going to be doing the part two to the bonus episode, I think, this Sunday. I have relatives visiting, so I'm not sure how we'll make that work, but I'm, it's a major priority of mine, so I want to do that. Um, of course, take a photograph of the artwork you created, join the Facebook group, upload to the Facebook group if you want to participate in that upcoming bonus feedback episode. It's all free, but if you want to support the channel with a small donation, including using, I don't know, a dollar through PayPal, $50 million through Super Chat, whatever feels comfortable, um, you can use PayPal, Super Chat, e-transfer, check in the mail, uh, money order, all those Links are down below if you want to contact me through the Facebook group or my website. Those, my email and all that stuff. Do so. I would love to hear from you. So, there's our original painting. And then there's my version of it. Um, so, we definitely took a circuitous route to get to this point. Um, but I... I I like the kind of detour we took. It, it also, I've never gone in quite that direction. I've never sort of put a blue um, uh, kind of wash over top of the Input Matura, and then we had this green, and it looked kind of space alien y. But that color is, it's super subtle, but there is parts of it that are coming through. And that's the, that's the beautiful thing about a painting, when it kind of, the more you look at it, the more it starts to reveal little things to you. So I, I'm more than happy with the way this painting turned out. I, I could have spent more time, let's say, on the hair. You know, that seems a little bit hurried here at the end, but uh, um, just like anything else, if I had spent another 20 hours on it, it would turn out perfect. But uh, all good things must come to an end eventually, right? Let's um, zoom in. And maybe let's just start at the bottom, work our way up here. So we have that hand. You know, considering how small this is, that's my fingernail, that hand, it feels pretty good. You know, the original painting, 36 by 24, that's a pretty big painting. 
So you're, this is a 9 by 12. So we could at least fit four of, we could fit four, basically that is four times the size, making it almost life size that hand. So that gives us a lot more opportunity to play. And she was, you know, that beautiful little um, reflected light on the darker side of her hands. All oh, that's so beautiful. But there's just only so much room. I think in terms of the colors, I'm, I'm almost, I feel like I'm very happy with the way that turned out. The colors are almost exact. And I think it's probably because of that blue that's underneath there that is just very subtly impacting how that color looks. It would have looked different if had I just left that uh, warm yellow imprimatura. Let's see, on this side, you know, the, the dress too, I feel pretty happy with what we got. You know, and st again, instead of it being a blue, we've got a little bit of a greenish hue underneath all of that. Uh, I don't, it doesn't bother me in, in, in any way whatsoever. Uh, I do just want to touch that up. I mean, I feel it looks a little bit here looks more red. I kind of went a little bit overboard, perhaps. Um, whereas the other arm, I think I did a more effective job of replicating what she did. I could have put a bigger highlight here. Oh, let's even just look at her clothes. So look, I think the clothes are pretty close. You know, I'm, there could have been a little bit more warm blue, perhaps in a few places and I could have done a better job or I didn't really even do much dry brushing there um, so that could have been more effective and that's it's pretty hard to, to do dry brushing or blending when we're talking about a scale so small um, same thing with her hair I really love the way that uh, Margaret Keene did this hair I mean that that alone should get her into the Museum of Modern Art. I mean, that is just gorgeous. There's very few people who can execute hair that effectively. Um, you know, I kind of, I, I was eyeballing this and didn't quite, wasn't able to get that fold into the fabric like that. And I probably could spend a little more time adding those details. Uh, I'm also pretty ha uh, looks like I guess I could have put a little bit of extra white but I like how subtle her collarbone area is I think that's very very nice um, I wonder what that little splotch is maybe that was a mistake or a hole or something that somebody's tried to fix you know I think the the face here you know not my my happiest proudest moment even with the jaw that's that line there is a little bit strong but again, we're talking the scale, it makes this really difficult to, to do it as, as nicely and as, as subtle as the great master Margaret Keene herself did. Um, you know, with that hair, you know, I think I really overdid it with the, the brown, that warm brown. I really could have probably painted most of that out and just left the darker areas kind of near her neck. Um, and opted for a little bit more sandy blonde colors up there. So my hair is definitely way more extreme and pop than hers. Again, the, the subtlety that she displayed there is fantastic. Um, her mouth maybe is a little bit too wide. It should have been a little bit more narrow, but you know, again, we're talking the, my the length of my fingernail. And I probably could have darkened her eyes down a little bit, especially underneath her, the uh, top eyelid. So, I mean, there's, there's lots of little things that I could do. I could even darken that side of her neck a bit more for sure. Um, she also has a bit more of a pointy chin in Margaret Keene's version. Mine's a little bit rounder. 
<laughs> and it's funny because I tend to kind of round out all my figures anyway, which tends to make them look a little bit, um, maybe more like me, a little bit more round. <laughs> I think like artists always tend to do that. Um, the background, I think, turned out well. So I think this is, uh, let's just bring us back to, oh, her signature. I think I'm just going to leave it without the signature, just, I mean, for now. Uh, I think we've got the idea here. We did do the signature in the previous episode. Uh, I'm just looking, maybe that hair could have, my, my hair looks a little bit more flat. Hers has got a bit more bit more bounce especially right at the top of her head but again the, we're talking so subtle these differences right okay everyone thanks a lot for painting along with me a much longer episode than i was expecting to do but uh that's just the way the cookie crumbles so we'll see you i think on sunday to, to pick up where we left off on our feedback episode and i'm looking forward to there's still there's another couple hundred artworks we haven't looked at. So if you want to participate, the, upload your stuff to the Facebook group as quickly as possible. And look, there's Lolly. Can't believe I missed this. Ah, looks great though, Michael. Thanks, Lolly. Well, we'll catch you um, in the next episode then. Have a great night, everyone. Take care. And good night. Good night. Thanks for painting with me. Good night.